My name is Laura Bruno. I'm from Ottawa, and I'm a member of uh, the ADRIC board. And um, I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker, who is Howard Sapers. Howard Sapers is the Correctional Investigator of Canada, and he has served in that role since 2004. He leads a team of hardworking professionals that work independently, and they deal with the treatment of federally incarcerated persons in this country. Areas of concern for Howard's office include safety, lawful, and humane corrections. It's a heavy burden at times, and Howard's work includes addressing matters such as death while in custody, detention conditions for Canadians, segregation, and public safety. I have known Howard for nearly a decade, and I've heard him speak about his mandate. His qualifications, experience, and talent, along with numerous interesting and unknown facts about the business of corrections in Canada, cause Howard to be invited to address audiences worldwide. Adric is so pleased to welcome Howard as our keynote speaker today, and it is my honor to introduce Mr. Howard Sapers, Canada's Correctional Investigator. Thank you, Laura. Hello. Um, there are oh, there are stairs. Okay, I was going to say that. That could have been awkward. Um, I am very happy to be here, and I really do appreciate the opportunity to spend some time with you. As usual, I've got way too much to say. Just ask the Minister of Public Safety. And uh, so I've prepared notes for about a three-hour session. So tuck into your dessert and, uh, you know, loosen your ties or take off your shoes because it's going to be a while. And as, as Laura uh, indicated in her uh, very kind introduction, um, I only talk about really cheery things. You know, it, it's this, I mean, you're going to walk away just whistling zippity doo -dah after after this. So um, at least it's not an evening presentation. That could be really, really depressing. So at least you can go stand in the sunshine after after we talk for a bit. So I can't see what's on the screen behind me. Did the slide just advance? Okay, the technology is working. So we'll um, see if I can not break it. Um, I am the Correctional Investigator of Canada. That means that I report on the problems of offenders that have been sentenced to more than two years and spending time in federal penitentiaries. Uh, the Office of the Correctional Investigator has been around since 1973. It was established after a bloody and deadly riot at Kingston Penitentiary. Um, there's a whole side story to, to that, but the Government of Canada was actually very forward-looking and established uh, really one of the first specialized correctional ombuds offices in the world. Um, and I have the, uh, the pleasure of having been named the Correctional Investigator in 2004, April Fool's Day actually of 2004. Um, Notwithstanding, uh, the third, only the third person to ever hold that office. Uh, it's a very slow rotation position in spite of the former Prime Minister's desires. And um, anyway, on, on we go. I want you to, uh, usually people laugh more when I say that. <laughs> this either means that you're not with me on that point or you weren't paying attention. So I will try to say something clever later on in the presentation and we'll see whether or not you're, you're still not paying attention. Um, I want you to remember throughout this presentation that um, those high, thick prison walls aren't just built to keep people inside. Uh, of course, they're also built to uh, keep prying eyes out. And these are very closed environments that we're going to be talking about. Um, so when my, my staff go in and we do investigations when we receive complaints, sometimes we do investigations on our own motion. Um, and based on these investigations, I do make recommendations to ensure safe, lawful, and humane correctional practice. Um, the priority areas um, of concern, the systemic investigations we do, some of them have already been mentioned, um, ensuring appropriate access to health care, preventing deaths in custody, addressing issues related to discrimination and overrepresentation, particularly of Canada's Indigenous peoples. 
Um, in the first half of my presentation this afternoon, I'm going to discuss a little more detail the role and the mandate of my office, and then I'm going to describe the clients that we serve. I'll provide some examples of correctional decisions um, that, while on the surface, may have appeared to be compliant with law and policy, um, but they weren't necessarily reasonable or fair, or they may have resulted in a differential outcome for an identifiable group. I'll conclude with a case study based on an investigation that we just finished. Um, this highlights problems of families when they're trying to get information from the Correctional Service of Canada in regard to the death of a loved one behind bars. Um, hopefully, what I have to say today will resonate with you a little bit and uh, might make you question a few things, and hopefully it will also mesh with your own beliefs and concerns about the Canadian criminal justice system. So, okay, see I've already, okay. So, I think this is, no, I'm not, I'm not there yet, so don't look at the screen, okay? <laughs> I don't know how to make it stop jumping around. So um, the mandate of my office is actually pretty narrow. I only do one thing, and that is I conduct independent investigations into the decisions, recommendations, acts, or omissions of the Correctional Service of Canada. I look for fairness, I look for compliance, I look for legality. I view correctional practice through a human rights lens. That is the value base of the office. The office is independent of the Correctional Service of Canada. I'm appointed by order and council, um, independent of the Department of Public Safety, independent of the Minister of Public Safety. The minister, in fact, has no say or no role in the operations or the decisions or the management of the office in any way. Uh, what I like to say is that my office is arm's length, but not out of touch. In fact, Though the office is independent, this doesn't mean that we're in any way disconnected. In, uh, the office is an essential part of the legal framework that governs federal correctional practice. In this regard, the office reinforces the notion of the rule of law. My staff has access to all facilities, records, and personnel of the Correctional Service of Canada, CSC. Our legislation provides for penalties for anyone who attempts to impede our work these are very broad authorities and helps us in the pursuit of fair and effective corrections. On an annual basis, my office receives and addresses thousands of offender complaints, contract, contacts, and inquiries. My team of investigators regularly visit the federal institutions to meet with both inmates and staff. In fact, that, um, that map if there were any prison geeks in the audience like me, you might recognize that map is a riff on the travels of John Howard through Europe in the 1700s. <laughs> John Howard traveled through Europe in the 1700s on horse and buggy. Um, my staff actually take Air Canada. Uh, sometimes there's not much of a difference. Um, but the point is, see, you are paying attention. Uh, that takes a lot of pressure off me, actually. Um, the point is that my, my, my staff travel to all of the correctional sites. We don't do this as a paper exercise. This is very much a human process for us. Um, we regularly visit the institutions. We meet with the inmates. We meet with the staff of the correctional service. Uh, but my investigators are not advocates. They don't take sides when they're investigating complaints about the correctional service. Our focus is on what the law and policy provides for. We will only take steps if it's determined that a complaint has merit. All offender contact is confidential. And much like the work that many of you do, third party impartiality is the source of the office's influence and credibility with CSC staff, with federal inmates, parliamentarians, and of course, Canadians. Consistent with ombudsman practice, recommendations are not binding on the CSC. I cannot compel the commissioner to accept or to act on my recommendations. In my role, I accept that some points of disagreement or difference will always exist between my office and the public agency that it oversees. 
But even in disagreement, the correctional service is required to respond to the recommendations in a timely manner. If the action of the correctional service, in my opinion, is inadequate or inappropriate, then the legislation is very clear. It says, I shall inform the minister of that fact. Answerability is a central requirement of a transparent and accountable correctional system, and it's embedded in the Corrections and Conditional Release Act. Though I have the power to hold hearings and summon and examine under oath any person related to a matter being investigated, for the most part, my office relies on less formal methods to resolve complaints. It's office practice to encourage offenders uh, to address issues informally and at the lowest level. Uh, in fact, many of my investigative staff use ADR. They have training or experience in mediation negotiation. But unlike most ombud schemes, we are not an office of last resort. We do not require offenders to exhaust internal redress mechanisms before contacting us. The primary reason for this is that the grievance system, the internal mechanism for dispute resolution within the correctional service, the dysfunction of that system is actually what was behind the riot at Kingston Penitentiary in 1971 that led to the creation of the office in 1973. And I can tell you that system continues to be dysfunctional. So it makes no sense to refer our folks back to a system that's already broken. Most issues are resolved at the institutional level or at the coal face, and on a daily basis, where my team of investigators use a variety of methods to influence change. There are other mechanisms as well, including my annual special and public interest reports to bring unresolved issues and concerns to the attention of the commissioner or the minister or parliament as a whole or the media. Striking a balance between the broad powers of the office and the interventions used in a particular investigation is done with a view to maintaining a positive working relationship with CSC, as well as effective and efficient complaints resolution. Now, no, we're still there. Being accessible and having a regular presence in federal penitentiaries is fundamental to meeting the office's mandate. A regular schedule of visits helps ensure follow-up and timely access to our services. Some of our office's most important and impactful work takes place on staff visits to the 43 federal penitentiaries across Canada. As I said, it seems like many of my staff travels for a living. Of course, the staff that travel to the institutions are actually looked at with envy by some of the other staff in the office particularly those who spend all their time locked into small rooms focused on monitors watching hundreds and hundreds of use of force videotapes. Now, that's a job, I can tell you, that leaves you with a smile on your face at the end of the day. Um, as you can see by the numbers on the screen, it's a heavy and a demanding workload for a staff complement of only 36 full-time employees. Four intake officers answer those 25,000 phone calls. A team of three manage the use of force reviews. This takes a toll. We have to pay attention to the well-being of our staff as well as our clients. The modern prison reflects problems and inequalities of the larger society that it serves. The inmate population is diverse, it's complex, and challenging. The overall profile of people serving a federal sentence suggests that many are not well equipped to represent or advocate for themselves or to survive well in a prison environment. Many offenders come from socially disadvantaged, marginalized, or impoverished backgrounds. The socioeconomic status of this population is low, as indicated by their history of substandard housing, low employment rates, low educational achievement, and low income. More than 60% of the inmate population at intake has an identified education need. That means they haven't completed high school. There is a higher incidence of chronic illness, infectious disease, premature mortality, and health risk amongst sentenced offender populations. Most persons in custody have experienced substantial adverse events in childhood, such as witnessing extreme family violence or being involved with the child welfare and protection systems. 
at least half report a history of childhood physical, sexual, or emotional abuse. Social and life histories such as these cannot easily be disentangled from their conflict with the law. Mental health issues are estimated to be two to three times more common amongst offenders than in the general community. According to a recent one-day snapshot that we did, about a third of the overall inmate population that day were on an, a psychotropic medication. That day's numbers were 46% of women and 30% for men had such a prescription. More than 35% of offenders meet the criteria for two or more mental disorders. This is a disturbingly high comorbidity rate. Nearly seven in 10 men and eight in 10 women offenders have an assessed substance abuse history. In fact, almost two thirds of federally sentenced offenders self-report using an intoxicant, drug or alcohol, on the day of their current federal offense. Inmates with concurrent mental health and substance abuse disorders have the highest risk and needs ratings more extensive criminal histories, higher rates of admission to segregation, are more likely to incur both serious and minor institutional charges, and they're more likely to return to custody or to reoffend. Outcomes such as these suggest that there are some underlying systemic issues that contribute to disproportionate rates of incarceration for certain identifiable groups. Hmm. It's working. As I reported in January 2016, a few months ago, the proportion of Indigenous people in Canadian penitentiaries had reached a shocking 25% of the total inmate population. For federally sentenced Indigenous women, their rates now exceed 35%. One in three women in federal pen is of Aboriginal heritage. The incarceration rate for Indigenous adults in Canada is estimated to be seven times higher than the incarceration rate of non-Indigenous adults. Of course, disproportionate rates of contact and conflict with Canada's criminal justice system are nothing new for Indigenous Canadians. As the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has most recently reminded us, these issues manifest from the lingering effects of residential schools, the legacy of reserves, higher rates of substance abuse, poverty, substandard housing in Aboriginal communities, and a continuing high rate of contact with child welfare systems. These are the roots and the feeders of a federal correctional system which disproportionately holds people of indigenous ancestry longer in higher security levels than any other group of Canadians. When offender complaints that are related to the further deprivation of liberty are brought forward to the office, we try to determine if the decision makers considered all the factors, whether there's a clear relationship between the facts and the conclusions reached. It's not enough for correctional staff to simply confirm that policy or protocols were followed. A decision that refers to policy does not always mean that it's in compliance. Simply acknowledging negative aspects of Aboriginal social history does not mean, does not meet the test set out in court decisions such as Gladue. There must be evidence of an analysis of that history and how it was applied to decisions. Let me illustrate by way of an example that has significant liberty interests for incarcerated individuals. A decision to place an inmate in segregation or solitary confinement for administrative reasons requires a high level of procedural fairness and a serious and robust assessment that the measure is in fact warranted. And remember that segregation in a Canadian federal penitentiary means being locked into a cell sometimes as small as five meters square for 23 out of every 24 hours and having very, very limited human contact. The law requires that segregation be used sparingly only when all other alternatives have been exhausted and for the least amount of time necessary. Policy further requires CSC decision makers to take into consideration an offender's health care needs in all segregation placement decisions. Despite these legal and policy safeguards, nearly 
half the inmate population has experienced segregation at least once during their present sentence, suggesting that this measure is anything but exceptional. Unlike disciplinary segregation, there are no upper limits in law and how long an inmate can be held in administrative seg. The requirement to take into consideration the health status or the social history of perhaps an aboriginal offender in segregation decisions is often all but ignored. Decision records often simply state that these factors were noted. Aboriginal offenders continue to be overrepresented in the segregation population, and they have the longest stays once segregated. For Indigenous women, the situation is bleaker. Almost half of all female admissions to segregation last year were accounted for by Indigenous women. Segregation is still widely used to manage self-injurious, mentally disordered, and suicidal offenders. For an offender with a mental health issue, not knowing when or if you're going to be released from segregation can be a deeply unsettling and potentially unsafe practice. Self-injurious inmates who are placed in segregation purportedly for their own safety perceive this measure as punitive or disciplinary. In some cases, it actually exacerbates the frequency intensity and severity of their self-harming. A disproportionate number of prison suicides occur inside segregation cells. In my office's three-year review of the federal inmate suicides, which was released in September of 2014, we found that 14 of 30 suicides reviewed occurred inside a segregation cell. Now think about that for a minute. In one of the most secure and most surveilled parts of the institution, these men and women found the opportunity and the means to end their life. Even while locked up for 23 hours a day and being constantly watched, these individuals managed to kill themselves. In the majority of cases, they were either known immediate Uh, events or risks or circumstances that indicated suicidal intent. Most had previously attempted suicide. Most had a documented mental health issue or a concurrent substance abuse disorder. On the basis of these findings, I've concluded that segregation is in fact a dangerous practice and that it's overused. I have made recommendations calling for legal limits and safeguards on how long an inmate can be held in these conditions. And the good news is is that segregation placements are actually down this year. And the Correctional Service is to be congratulated for that. To sustain this trend, some form of external oversight or independent adjudication for continued or multiple segregation placements is required. This means legislative reform is necessary. I was glad to see this issue flagged in Prime Minister Trudeau's mandate letter to the Minister of Justice. And I am hopeful that we will soon see some action on this file. My office recently released an investigative report entitled In the Dark, an investigation of death in custody information sharing and disclosure practices in federal corrections. The report documents the extent and manner in which the Correctional Service of Canada discloses information with family members of an inmate who has died in custody. This investigation suggests that there is much room for improvement. As the title of my report implies, the findings of In the Dark point to issues of openness, transparency, accountability, dignity, and compassion. We found that CSC does not proactively or routinely share information with designated next of kin. There is little consistency in the information that is provided. Families report being frustrated and discouraged by delays and lack of information. Even though CSC is statutorily obligated to investigate forthwith all deaths in custody, families often have to wait a year or several years before receiving a copy of the internal investigation reports. Families must submit a formal access to information request to obtain a copy of these reports, even though the privacy legislation, the Privacy Act, permits the commissioner to freely share the information. 
Documents obtained through such requests are often heavily and unnecessarily redacted. The redacted reports often remove pertinent contextual information which changes the overall meaning and conceals evidence of noncompliance, errors, or deficiencies on the part of the correctional service. Practices such as these leave little room for public scrutiny or legal recourse. For a grieving family, privacy concerns should not be routinely used as an excuse to trump, I'm sorry, I don't know how else to say that, <laughs> as an excuse to trump their right to know how a family member died in custody. There is a broader and much more compelling public interest to be considered and balanced in such disclosures. Now, I'm encouraged that this investigation is leading to some clear and significant reforms in how CSC communicates information to families following the death of a loved one. In fact, just last week, on October 4th, the service accepted all of my recommendations in whole or in part. The service has modified its approach to vetting and releasing information contained in its national investigation reports. It's working more closely with family members to ensure information is shared appropriately, consistently, and in a more timely and compassionate manner. I continue to urge the service to be more proactive and transparent in disclosing information to families who have lost a loved one behind bars. Families, and indeed all Canadians, deserve answers when a person in state custody dies unexpectedly from unnatural causes or under suspicious circumstances. Transparency, accountability, and oversight in corrections remains a work in progress. Prisons today, like yesteryear, are still largely closed to public view. In such a closed system, the potential for abuse of arbitrary power remains present. Outside intervention by courts, by parliament, by independent oversight and external review committees continues to be necessary in ensuring safe, lawful, and humane care and treatment of citizens deprived of their liberty by the state. Outside of my office, there remains limited means for federally sentenced inmates to bring their issues forward post-sentence. There is little access to legal aid and few clinics have expertise working with incarcerated individuals. There is also, for a variety of reasons, limited professional capacity or interest in representing inmates. Few cases ever get to courts. In many other matters, because of lengthy delays, um, the issues at stake are often rendered moot before they can ever be heard or presented for consideration. While courts at all levels have gotten involved, um, access to post-sentence justice remains a considerable problem. Inmates complain that they have limited access to legal materials, let alone lawyers or other advocates or supporters. This adds to the already considerable hurdles that an incarcerated litigant faces. CSC is also scaling back its own alternative dispute resolution initiative, which had been piloted at 10 institutions. By all indications, this pilot project was a runaway success. It resolved close to 50% of complaints and grievances at the institutional level without anything else going forward. Don't understand the decision to shut it down. It's unfortunate. As you all know, when ADR is used appropriately, it's faster, it's less expensive than going to court. It gives the parties an opportunity to tell their side of the stories and have a say in the final decision. It helps people come up with flexible and creative options by exploring what each of them wants to achieve and why. And it gives increased access to justice because people who cannot get to a court or couldn't afford the legal fees even if they could can still access a dispute resolution mechanism that works. For these reasons, and as much as ever before, the use of ADR is essential in ensuring fair practices inside prisons. Now, prisons are harsh. They're not supposed to be pleasant, but they're not supposed to be dungeons either. Churchill, Dostoevsky, Mandela, they've all observed that a society can be measured by how it treats those at the margins. Mindful that the rule of law 
does not stop at the prison gate, we Canadians should be concerned about how history may reflect upon us and how we treat those deprived of their freedoms. Thank you again for inviting me to be with you today um, and uh, wish you best wishes in your work.